Right, good afternoon everyone. Uh, welcome to today's um, webinar session. Uh, the session is titled Social Unrest in South Africa. Um, I think um, everybody is aware of what transpired over the last week and for a number of us, uh, we were sort of um, you know, directly affected uh, by the, the social unrest that took place, uh, predominantly in KwaZulu-Natal, but also in the Gauteng as well as in other places uh, in South Africa. And the intention of today's session is just to take stock of the unrest and its impact on the automotive manufacturing value chain. Um, you know, we weren't prepared to have a session obviously on this topic, but um, given what happened last week, it was felt there was a definite need uh, to, to have a session uh, touching on this, uh, you know, set, uh, issue. In terms of uh, the session, obviously welcome to all of you. We've got cluster firms that are in attendance uh, that belong to our various programs um, that we facilitate. We've also got a number of non-cluster members uh, participating because we have extended the invite to uh, the entire automotive industry, stakeholders, uh, and then guests and panelists. And obviously welcome you all to today's session. Um, I'd like to strongly encourage everyone or the, the attendees uh, to engage with the, the, you know, what we covered in today's session. Uh, the um, panelists are going to give their insights in terms of what they've noted, um, you know, in, in a short while. Um, and um, we will allow questions, uh, you know, to the panelists. What I'd like to request is that you utilize the chat feature um, and put your questions into the chat or the Q&A feature. And then when they're all finished, uh, we can look at, at responding to those questions. Uh, and then later on, we'll have a, a bit more of a discussion around some of the issues related to a specific firm. But we obviously do encourage, um, you know, you to engage with the session, uh, particularly given the, the, set, um, you know, the, the, the impact it has on industry. Uh, the disclaimer just highlights that obviously we as BIM analysts uh, can't be held uh, liable for any of the content that's shared in, in today's session. I'm not going to read through it. It's, I think it's more important to, for us to get through to uh, the, the focus of today's session. Um, similarly, in terms of the competition law, um, it's, it's important that we just state that um, you know, we will abide by the competition law and, and nothing related to uncompetitive behavior will be discussed in today's session. And I'm not going to read it, but it is stated there and um, we will obviously ensure that it is the case. Um, it's also important just to acknowledge our funders. Uh, the clusters operate as public-private partnerships uh, between the automotive industry and the public entities. Uh, in that regard, we must acknowledge the economic development units of Etiquini Municipality for their support of the Durban Automotive Cluster and the Economic Develop Environmental Affairs and Tourism um, Division of the Province of the Eastern Cape for their support of uh, the Eastern Cape Automotive Industry for, uh, Forum. So their support is, is duly acknowledged. All right, in terms of today's session, you know, our session brings together, uh, you know, the, the automotive industry um, to the best of our ability. Um, and it's, the intention is to take stock of the impact of last week's unrest. Um, the intention is not to unpack why it happened, even though, you know, that one or two people may mention that, but not to unpack, un, unpack the why, um, and, and the thing, but rather say, it, it happened, acknowledge it happened, um, which I think we can all do. Um, what is the current situation and how do, you, how do we attempt to move forward, uh, you know, as, as a sector in that regard? We are facilitating similar sessions for other sectors. We had a chemical session this morning. Uh, there was a furniture session that was held uh, earlier and we have a clothing session, clothing and textile session a little bit later taking place. Uh, there is going to be a session poll uh, or session polls that are going to be undertaken in this particular session later on. Um, there's also an online survey that has been sent out. Um, and I do apologize because I, I, I suspect and not suspect, I know that a lot of you have been inundated with these surveys related to the social unrest. And we've also sent one out. Um, we've been requested by the presidency to try and also get a better understanding of the impact of the social unrest on, manufact on the manufacturing sector. And our survey is an attempt to do that. So uh, you would have, a lot of you would have received the survey. And we're also going to post up, oh, it's already been done, uh, post a survey uh, into the chat. Um, and I'd, I'd like to request that you look at completing it. It shouldn't take more than five minutes of your time. And it's just to give some more uh, concrete insight in terms of the, the actual impact um, on the manufacturing sector um, 
well, in, in KZN, but obviously more broadly as well. And um, I'd like to request, if possible, to please submit the online survey at 5 p.m. today, um, because we need to compile a sector situation report, which is based on the poll findings, based on any qualitative input from this session, as well as is based on the survey uh, that has you've been requested to complete. So again, I know there's a lot uh, of these surveys, uh, you know, out there at the moment, um, and they are all important. And it's just, uh, you know, to try and ensure there's a real understanding of the impact. Um, on the industry. Um, again, most of you probably uh, have seen the schematic on the right here. There's an app that thing, and it just highlights that there, uh, you know, there was numerous hotspots, obviously predominantly in KwaZulu and Natal, um, but the accounting was also affected, as well as other areas um, of South Africa. Um, and I think that something that I've noted in the in the press of late is that yes, it's happened in particular re regions, but uh, you know, it could. Uh, just as well happen elsewhere if, 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 if sort of the underlying issues are, are not addressed. Um, in terms of counting the cost, um, this schematic sort of um, broadly outlines uh, the impact. Uh, this was compiled by the South African Property Owners Association, and I've seen this has been referred to quite a lot. Um, in terms of the impact, a number of malls uh, were, had extensive damage, warehouses uh, were destroyed, and uh, I think you would see that in the, in, in the media, factories, uh, liquor outlets and distributors, so a lot of extensive damage took place. Um, obviously, there was a lot of looting that occurred, and that was probably the, 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 well, the one of the things that received the most uh, media um, exposure was the number of looting that took place. I think we've all seen the evidence of that. Um, in terms of the, the, the impact on, on, on the economy, there are about 150,000 jobs that, that are at risk. Um, obviously, in the informal trade, a lot of people have been affected. Um, tens of thousands of businesses have been affected. Uh, the impact for the GDP in KZN is estimated to be at 20 billion rand, which obviously uh, means that there will be a significant impact for the national uh, GDP, and that is outlined there, being approximately 50 billion rand. And a lot of brands were significantly impacted. So again, uh, we've seen these numbers. Uh, I think we can all agree that, uh, you know, the, the social unrest had a significant impact um, on, on sort of positive Nutel, but uh, nationally as, as well. Uh, in terms of, of the, the automotive sector, what we as a cluster attempted to do last week was engage with our members um, via various forms, um, WhatsApp, uh, you know, telephonically, and obviously via email as well. Uh, the initial, the primary intention was to, to, to confirm that people were okay, they were safe. Um, you know, that was the main reason, just to, to check on people and say, you know, our contacts uh, and their employees and their factories, um, how were they doing? Um, and then obviously we attempted to get some additional insight in terms of what was the impact on the sector. And this was done last week, so it was still sort of work in progress and a lot of it was unverified. But some of the key points that were noted uh, from my engagements um, at the peak of the crisis is that major damage and theft um, had not been reported as yet, but it was too early to tell the true extent of that and that people still need to go to their sites when it was safe to assess the actual damage. Uh, we, we were aware, we are aware, um, of at least one uh, facility in Peter Marisburg, an automotive firm that was just destroyed. They were burned down and the response we received is they are uncertain if they were actually rebuilt. So we are aware of one facility uh, that was completely destroyed. Um, obviously factories closed for the whole of last week and um, I think we're all aware of that. And, um, we know the reasons for that. Um, a few companies did mention that, that a few people had been hurt, uh, but, but that had been limited, but there was a concern around sort of general trauma uh, being experienced. Um, COVID-19 communication channels that were set up obviously in 2020 um, were utilized to effectively engage with employees. So um, as my colleague Megan Vater said this morning, you know, one of the positives that emerged out of the, the COVID-19 pandemic is a lot of firms put these communication channels in place and they were able to, to utilize these uh, to, to, to engage with employees to find out how they were doing. Um, and the key point is that firms were very concerned about the health uh, safety and well-being of their employers. And that, that came through quite strongly, in particular in terms of some of my direct engagements. Um, obviously, there were concerns around depression, despair, food security, and fuel worries. I think everybody who um, you know, was close to the unrest would attest to that. Uh, obviously, things like severe stress and panic, high prevalence of looting I've already mentioned, um, you know, concerns about, more concerned about the community than business. Uh, a lot of us were physically protecting our homes and communities over the course of last week. Um, obviously, employees unable to get to work, 
um, concerns around the logistics and supply chain, um, raw materials, stock at ports, and again, a key point that came through, authorities must make sure that the culprits are arrested and prosecuted, vital to help reestablish faith in government. You know, a lot of people I engage with highlighted this as being sort of a, a key point that they noted. They wanted to see action taking place in terms of the culprits. All right, I think I've said enough. I didn't want to take up too much time because I think we've got a lot to get through. Um, I'm now going to hand over to, to the three speakers, and we're very privileged to have, um, you know, uh, Michael Mabasa, uh, the CEO of the uh, NAMS, the Automotive Business Council, um, and obviously they are, uh, represent the, the, the larger vehicle manufacturers and key players in the country in the automotive sector. Um, we've got Renee Mathalal, the Executive Director of, of NARCAM, and uh, NARCAM represents the supply industry in the country. And we've got Ajiv Maharaj, who's the head of, head of Department Economic Strategy, Policy, Innovation and Research at the Etiquini Municipality. Um, and, and we've requested each of them, um, and, and we only engaged with them really on Friday last week. We've requested them just to give their insights in terms of what has occurred over the last week, you know, what has been the impact that they have noted in relation to, um, you know, whatever their, well, their particular responsibilities, um, you know, where do things currently stand, um, what does this mean for, for the sector or for the economy, depending on their perspective. And what areas do they believe require focus? So we weren't sort of, we don't want to go and prescribe to them exactly what they must or must not say. Uh, we said, but rather look at it from in terms of, you know, your sort of view of, of how this could impact the sector and what needs to be done going forward. All right. Um, Michael, um, can I ask you to get the ball rolling and, and from in terms of the, you know, norms perspective, give your insight in terms of the, the unrest that took place over the last week. And maybe just uh, yeah, there we are done already. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good afternoon uh, to uh, everyone who has joined us uh, this afternoon. Uh, we trust all of you are safe, uh, well, and in good spirits, uh, and also warm because today, obviously, we've seen as, uh, obviously some reduction of uh, lower temperatures, particularly inland. Uh, in Houting in particular. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. And uh, as you rightly indicated, NAMSA represents uh, obviously the automotive industry, specifically uh, our different um, uh, original equipment manufacturers in the country, uh, both those who are manufacturing in South Africa and also those who are retailing uh, and, and mainly those who are importing vehicles into the country, uh, both passenger vehicles and also heavy commercial vehicles. Uh, I think the background was very, very su succinct, and I think the automotive industry has been largely impacted uh, negatively by the unrest that we've seen, um, particularly last week, uh, in both in KwaZulu-Natal and also uh, in Johannesburg. Uh, just to give you um, some context, um, the automotive industry represents about uh, seven local manufacturing OEMs in the country. Uh, one of whom is actually based in KwaZulu Natal, uh, which is Toyota. Uh, and then also we've got three uh, uh, original equipment manufacturers uh, who are based in Gauteng, um, which is Photomod Company, uh, Nissan SA, and also BMW. And in, in KwaZulu Natal, we've got Toyota. Um, and all these um, four manufacturers were certainly impacted upon directly and also indirectly uh, by these particular unrests. Over and above our manufacturing uh, uh, plants, uh, we also have um, the majority of our importing um, um, you know, OEMs, we call them retailing OEMs, that are bringing vehicles into South Africa, uh, and many of whom who are using um, Deben port uh, as their main port of entry to be able to bring uh, those imported vehicles into the country. Uh, and many of those were also impacted very, very directly because their capacity to be able to bring uh, vehicles into the country was also impacted uh, very negatively uh, during that particular week. Um, I'm sure that many of you are aware that uh, for Toyota in particular, which uh, is based in KwaZulu-Natal, uh, you know, that particular manufacturing plant, unfortunately, uh, was impacted directly upon and the manufacturing process in the plant uh, had to obviously be suspended uh, for more than five days uh, during those particular uh, days in order for us to be able to make sure that the safety uh, of uh, the people who, who work in those 
um, 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 areas are actually uh, not compromised and also the safety of our suppliers who uh, supply the plant itself are also not compromised in any shape or form. Just to give you a sense, as, as it relates to all the 48 um, different OEMs that we have, because NAMSA represents uh, 48 different brands that we have in the country today. Um, we've got six of the seven manufacturing OEMs that were impacted by the unrests in one shape or the other. And the six uh, manufacturing OEMs that were impacted is Nissan SA, uh, Ford uh, Motor Company, Toyota, as I've indicated, Isuzu, Mercedes-Benz SA, and also BMW. And, and all these uh, companies have given us very extensive reports uh, in relation to the nature of uh, damage they've suffered, particularly in the retailing uh, environment, because many of them obviously have um, you know, a dealership network across uh, the provinces, particularly the two provinces uh, that were impacted upon. Uh, and many of those dealerships unfortunately had to uh, close down as a result of the um, uh, incidents that we've seen. In our commercial, heavy commercial vehicle space, we've got Daimler trucks, we've got UD trucks, MAN, Volvo Group, and also Mahindra, who were also impacted very directly uh, by the um, um, unrest last week. In relation to our retailing OEMs, we've got Motors Group, Mazda, Hyundai, Kia, uh, Renault, um, Stellantis, uh, Jaguar Land Rover, Mitsubishi, and also uh, Suzuki uh, Auto, uh, which was also impacted upon uh, very, very directly, particularly at the uh, dealership network. And naturally also, because most of our dealership rely very heavily uh, in relation to the support that we get from, from our component manufacturers and also some of the aftermarket uh, suppliers who supply these dealerships uh, with different goods and services. Uh, those obviously uh, goods and services were not able to come through as a result of uh, the unrest uh, themselves. One other key component for us as the auto sector uh, that we've seen as a very huge uh, disruption was mainly the N3 corridor uh, because we use this corridor uh, very, very extensively uh, to be able to transport uh, goods and services uh, between the ports of entry uh, of Deben, Richards Bay, and Maputo uh, into and out of the country. Uh, and, and unfortunately, because of these unrests, uh, most of those um, were disrupted very, very hugely um, as a result of uh, those goods, goods and services not being able uh, to make their way up into Houting and also other provinces, including our neighboring countries, because you'd recall that South Africa is sharing um, you know, some um, borders with landlocked countries such as Eswatini, Lesotho, Botswana, Namibia, um, and, and, and some of the goods and services that we transport also into those particular neighboring countries were also impacted very directly as a consequence uh, of uh, the unrest that we have seen. We are obviously currently finalizing a report uh, to quantify uh, you know, the, the rents and cents of the impact. Uh, we've requested obviously all our members to be able to provide us with the information uh, so that we can really be able to uh, indicate from a, 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 a rents and cents a financial point of view the magnitude of the impact uh, because some of our dealerships are obviously uh, hugely impacted, many of whom are still closed today uh, and some uh, for, obviously fortunately we were able to uh, reopen at the beginning of this week um, and we are still obviously in the process of finalizing uh, the, the, the counting of the cost so that we can really be able to measure uh, qualitatively and also quantitatively the impact uh, of this particular uh, unrest uh, that we've seen uh, in the last couple of uh, days. The, the, the last point I wanted to really uh, punctuate uh, is obviously the issues around um, um, overall investment. And I think the impact uh, for us as the automotive industry, as you all know, uh, to invest in any manufacturing plant in South Africa, it's not a, an immediate decision that our local OEMs take uh, because these are decisions that are taken often at a global level and they are taken by obviously these multinational corporations uh, in their headquarters, irrespective of whether those are in Germany, in Japan, in the United States, uh, or in South Korea, or any, anywhere else uh, around the world where mo most of these uh, manufacturing plants are actually located. 
We have seen, obviously, a lot of concern. We have received, obviously, um, you know, requests for information from many of these particular uh, global partners uh, who wanted, obviously, to get assurances, uh, not only from the authorities in South Africa, but also from us as, as, as officials who are working within this industry in order for us to be able to give them a sense of what this means uh, for South Africa, particularly from an investment uh, point of view. I mean, all, I think many of us are aware that uh, many of our plants are obviously taking, um, a, you know, a, a additional um, effort to, to really uh, try and do everything they can uh, to be able to attract new investments in the country. You would recall that at the beginning of this year, a Ford Motor Company uh, announced a 16 billion rent uh, investment into uh, the Ford a factory in Silverton in, in Swanee, um, and that investment has obviously uh, started, and we are certainly hoping that uh, the work that um, is going to be undertaken uh, in that particular plant uh, can be able to proceed without obviously giving uh, our investors any jittery, um, you know, um, um, uh, responses, uh, particularly because uh, these events of last week have obviously attracted a global uh, media coverage across the world. Um, uh, similarly, um, as you know, uh, three weeks ago, uh, Mercedes-Benz in East London also launched a new um, line for the C-Class, um, um, uh, new generation C-Class in, in that particular plant. And, and Mercedes-Benz obviously also indicated that they, they are looking at expanding, obviously, the work that they need to do in that plant in order for us to be able to evolve into new energy vehicles uh, in particular. Toyota as well made an announcement earlier this year, and we know that they're scheduled to launch a uh, Toyota Cross um, you know, in October this year, and certainly the events of the last couple of weeks has really uh, shook uh, quite a number of uh, our investors uh, you know, and, 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 you know, uh, unfairly during this particular time. So, so for us as the industry, we are certainly concerned about um, you know, the narrative that South Africa uh, is sending out to, to, the, to the rest of the investment community. Uh, and we are certainly working with authorities uh, quite very, very firmly uh, in the next couple of days so that we can really be able to reassure uh, not only our local uh, OEMs, but certainly their principals globally, uh, that South Africa is still an attractive investment uh, destination, particularly at this time where many of our uh, global manufacturers are beginning to recalibrate their plans, particularly in terms of new vehicles, new energy vehicles evolution, because as you all know, uh, the world is changing and it's changing very, very fast. Uh, many of our manufacturing plants are now recalibrating uh, and, and refocusing on where they are now going to be locating uh, new production lines uh, for the new generation of vehicles that are coming through as a result of new energy vehicles. And we really, as South Africa, do not want to lose out um, you know, as a potential destination where uh, many of these new energy vehicles will be produced. And I think uh, very, very firmly, um, the events of what we've seen in the last two weeks has really uh, dampened uh, the spirit uh, quite very firmly. And South Africa has a lot of work to do to be able to re-energize and reassure our investors that South Africa is still a, a destination of choice, uh, particularly for the automotive industry, so that we can really be able to make sure that we are able to grow our industry, particularly also at the back of the fact that we have the South African Automotive Master Plan uh, to 2035, where we have ambitions to increase our current uh, local capacity and production capacity uh, and double that particular capacity. Um, and we are only, uh, will only be able to do that if we are able to keep our investors in the country as much as possible. Chair, let me leave it there. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, and um, I, I look forward to hearing from other uh, panelists as well. Thank you very much. Uh, brilliant. Thank you very much, Michael. And yeah, you know, for me, sort of uh, some really, really good points made. I'm not going to sort of repeat them, but you know, I think the point around sort of um, you know this is a, an essay issue. You know, we can't sort of we can't sort of say it's a case in an issue and an, an issue in a certain area of the car thing. You know, whatever happens. Um, is reflective of, of the economy as a whole. And the investors look at it from that perspective. And I think, you know, that was a really, really important point that, you know, obviously, um, you know, it, it needs to be addressed, um, you know, uh, in that regard. Excellent. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, I'm now going to ask Renee Mathalal from NARCAM, who obviously represents the supply industry, to give his insight in terms of, of, of um, you know, the, what took place um, and his view on the, the situation. Um, Renee, um, are you there? 
Um, I am, and let's see. Uh, maybe the host can can switch me on. Talk to it, says anyway. I can, it says I can ask you to to start your video. It doesn't say uh -huh. I can actually. Ah, there we are. Perfect. Thank okay. you very much, Renee. Good, good. Uh, Sean, thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks to the organizers for the opportunity and. Uh, uh, let's start by reiterating what what my my friend uh, Mr. Mabasa said. Uh, outside of all of the challenges we've had, <coughs> COVID and violence and all of that, some of us in Gauteng uh, woke up this morning seeing polar bears running outside. It's, it's very cold here today. Uh, greetings to greetings to everyone. Uh, the topic can, I suppose, be. A really emotive one, but Sean, to, to come to, to what you said in your in your intro, uh, we're probably in the space now. We we're taking stock and rationally looking at, at where we go from here uh, is really important. Um, I think between yourself and Mike, um, you've you've covered a lot of uh, salient points on 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 what. What has happened and and likely impact going forward. So I'm I'm going to touch on I'm going to touch on on a few of them. It may it may sound repetitive, but I think the fact that we all in in the same space uh, attests to to how how it impacted on our sector. Um, so so as NARCAM, obviously we we are the the industry association for auto component manufacturers uh, across the country, and uh, we've got close on 150 members. Uh, the majority being in the in the manufacturing of, of components specifically for for supply to uh, OEM produ production lines, but interesting uh, the the production lines domestically, uh, but but also into into uh, independent exports and 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 aftermarket. Um, the 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 kind of uh, call for info or surveys that you're talking about Sean earlier um, I think we as NARCAM have also been uh, quite proactive in in gathering information from from our membership base and then during the course of last week uh, ran I think as early as Monday and then again on Thursday a kind of pulse check on on, on what was going on uh, and I think some of what you reflected on uh, kind of is is the same same results that 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 we were getting out of our our membership survey, but maybe I could just share for you that during the course of last week, um, uh, having polled our members, we had uh, ninety five percent of the KZN supplier uh, not our membership uh, closed. Uh, Forty-eight percent. So let's just say almost half of how ten uh, supplier companies closed, and in the balance of the province, uh, across all of them on our respondent uh, base for the sample, thirteen percent uh, closed in other regions of of the country. Um, obviously, a lot of impact around. Um, uh, the fact that staff were not able to get to work in the initial stages of the unrest, uh, the expectation that both during that period and coming forward, uh, there's going to be an impact in terms of short time for employees. Um, interestingly enough, uh, even before some of the OEMs, I mean, we knew that TSM was immediately impacted, but even before the other OEMs started introducing their own uh, closure plans, uh, we had close on 60% of our respondents saying that they are now seriously in a possibility of, of shutting the other OEM lines. So I think that those, those kind of statistics tell you how quickly and how widespread uh, stoppages and disruptions such as this can quickly impact the entire sector in South Africa. So yes, the issues were localized and obviously 95% uh, KZN impact, we understand that, but the nature of, of, of the value chain in South Africa is one that it says it, it can and does very quickly spread. And, and, and what Mike said is absolutely right. OEMs outside of the KZN province 
uh, very quickly found themselves in, in, in difficult situations. And then obviously with their shutdowns come uh, the, the impact uh, to, to suppliers across the country. I want to maybe just juxtapose how different, let's, let's give a few practical examples that came out in our survey of how uh, different company structures, um, I'm gonna give you three examples, but all of them uh, impacted in a way that could have just caused complete chaos. And in, in the case of one, definitely did. So, so I suspect the example you gave of, of, of uh, the, the plant that had burned down, also one that we are aware of, uh, and if it is the same one, then it's an emerging black owned supplier, the kind of company that we, we absolutely all doing headstands to try and, to try and find and support. And uh, now uh, feedback we're getting is that they're unlikely to open again. So small, recently started uh, entering the space and now burnt down raise, I think about 60 jobs lost there or something like that. Then on the complete opposite end of the scale, um, a huge global German owned multinational, I, 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 I see some of the staff members on this call, has three machines that are completely unique to their entire global production environment. And if were damaged, was going to stop 25% of global vehicle production. I think you really need to understand that. Think about 25% of global cars not able to produce because three machines damaged in the KZN region or potential to be damaged. And it, and it was really touch and go. Uh, the management of that company we were aware of were, were really, really uh, doing everything to try and secure the place and were, were, were on kind of, uh, were being targeted to, to be looted. Um, and then the third one is South African owned company supplying both OEMs and the aftermarket sitting with 800 tons of uh, flammable liquid chemicals in one of the Peter Maritzburg hotspots. And again, think about the impact of what started out as looting and then uh, because somebody doesn't understand what's in the plant random flames and you've got 800 tons of, of chemicals uh, going up, what could have then been the impact? So let's all agree that um, it, was, it, it was not kind of a situation where different companies could have had different impacts and different response. It, it was really, really serious all around. Um, where are we now? I think to some extent, obviously the sector is back to back to levels of, of production and supporting the OEMs who have, who have come back online. Um, but also still impacted in terms of uh, uh, some of the, the, the network or logistics challenges that we're facing. Uh, over, the port, over the past few, few days, uh, port challenges, delays, and as much as Transnet has done all of, all of what they could to, to come back on stream as quickly as possible, they were definitely the, the issues and delays at that level. Mike spoke about the N3 corridor. I think for me, that's a really important takeout. Is in the event of something like this, uh, the industrial linkages, the, the, the logistics that underpin this sector. Uh, I mean, we, we're familiar with, with, with the kind of uh, just in time, or, or just in sequence production that happens across the country. The moment these huge arterial routes start getting impacted, it brings, it brings the sector to, to a grinding halt. Um, so, so yeah, um, dealing with the, the logistics challenges has been, I suppose, the immediate aftermath. And uh, of course, I mean, security, we understand the need for, 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 greater, for, for the greater uh, state uh, intervention in the space. And, and we were one of the, the early associations to directly call upon uh, presidency and GTR in this respect last week. Um, I, I also think to some extent, uh, uh, something that we're going to have to really watch for going forward, Mark touched on it. Uh, and, and, and as much as uh, the investment environment definitely impacted, uh, I think from a supplier perspective, one of our other concerns is if we don't quickly deal and reproject an image for our sector as a whole, we also start getting some level of negative pushback on localization. I think most, uh, most companies who understand the, the global buying uh, arrangements 
uh, will also have a sense of being faced with, uh, especially the multinationals have this thing called a risk premium or risk rating. So now you've got South African subsidiaries fighting with other subsidiaries for allocation globally. And you've got, because of this kind of stuff, higher risk premiums attached to the South African location. That now impacts the localization, a localization decision. So not only is it new investment, it's possibility of replacement production or growing production uh, in, in existing plans and platforms. Uh, we've got to be smart about, about that and, and, and uh, understand that as we've got this drive, Mike was talking about the master plan, as we've got this drive to go to 60% localization levels, now we've got uh, inflated premiums coming into the mix as well, and that doesn't, doesn't bode well for us. Um, so yeah, I, I think uh, there's a few things that we, we, we've kind of uh, got to think about going forward. Um, I, I think uh, in autos, uh, we, we have the benefit of a master plan that is grounded on a lot of analysis and uh, has, has been out and, and one of the first master plans in an industrialization context for our economy. Uh, a lot of work has to be done to, to, to kind of uh, grow the confidence of the South African economy as a whole. And we've seen how different spaces of um, individual civil society working together to kind of protect immediate business interests in the past week uh, but having said that, if we want to now just step back and look at uh, what needs to happen for our sector specifically, I think that master plan and the space to implement really rapidly and, and be absolutely ruthless about chasing the objectives of, of that master plan is so key. Let's go back to some of the, the objectives like greater localization, uh, increased employment, uh, increased opportunity for, for black owned businesses. Uh, I mean, again, that, that example I gave you of the plant burning earlier, black owned, it's, it's so sad because that's exactly the kind of model that needs to be replicated and really quickly, greater localization, greater opportunities deep down the value chain for, for South African uh, auto sector. That is effectively the kind of, what's the word? Bu bulwark or protection against creating the kind of conditions that allow the situation that, that, that came last week. We, we, we got all the analysis on is it, is it looting, is it political, blah, blah, blah. We've read it all, but the reality is if we were not in the dire economic situation that we as South Africans find ourselves in, uh, you, don't, you don't kind of foment and create uh, the environment that this kind of thing can spread in. So, so, so let me kind of just wrap it up there and say, uh, you guys have covered a lot of a lot of the salient points previously, and uh, uh, I, I think it, it's kind of uh, similar experiences that we were starting to get out of our membership base as well. I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you very, very much, Renee. Some really good points. I think um, thank you for sharing some of the insights from your engagement with firms. I think some really uh, good takeaways from that. And then obviously the, the anecdotal insights in terms of, you know, three examples that, that, that you're aware of. And I think there's some uh, good points made there. And I know just on reflection with our chemical firms, I mean, they were also really worried last week, um, not you know, and obviously there's the concern about your facility being damaged, but, you know, they also said that they have uh, dangerous materials uh, on site. And if something happens there, there is a significant impact uh, for the environment, for the, the community around them. And um, there were some real worries. And I think your, your, your point about the firm that has 800 tons of chemicals is very valid. Obviously, the, the, the port on the corridors that came through. And then a um, really good sort of concluding point in relation to sort of the, the way forward and sort of the, the negative pushback on localization. So, um, yeah, thank you very, very much for that. Um, um, last in terms of our speakers is uh, Ajiv uh, Maharaj uh, from the, the city. Um, and, and he's just going to give some insights um, in terms of, of sort of the, the city's response in terms of, of you know, the, the sort of the current situation that um, transpired, well, the situation transpired last week. Um, Jeff, yeah, I think you, you, you've unmuted. Um, yeah, thanks. Okay. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, can I share a, a presentation? Please do, please do. Like I said, and just touch on the key points, but definitely please share. 
Uh, yeah, I, I won't go through all of the detail. I'll just try and, and, and uh, like you said, touch on, touch on some of the key points. Um, so we've, um, yeah, there we go. So we've been uh, putting together a response plan, working with uh, colleagues from other spheres of uh, uh, government. And uh, let me put that on presentation mode. Okay. Um, firstly, in terms of, uh, I think the, the, the key cause uh, and, and the, the previous speaker, I think, covered that, um, you know, if we weren't in the kind of economic situation that we are in uh, as a country, we, we probably wouldn't have seen uh, the kind of uh, mass destruction that we saw last week. So inequality, rampant unemployment, uh, critical uh, co cause of uh, what happened. Of course, there was a political catalyst, but there was also failures in terms of governance and, and policing. And, and all of that is, is kind of being looked at and reviewed uh, at the moment. In terms of uh, counting the costs for, for a tech many uh, alone, so we, we've also got some surveys uh, running. We've got uh, a simple tool that our um, uh, staff on the ground... Presentation mode is still in... Um... Uh, I've been trying to, to do All that. Right. It doesn't Maybe seem just to double be... click, double click the top under home, just to make it a little bit bigger. Um, now, if you click on where it says home, sorry, apologies, on the left there of your screen, just double click on home. Just, just double, yeah, where, where you were. Oh, sorry. Just Seems to be, be frozen. All right. Uh, uh, are you still on the second side? Yes. All right, right. Uh, right there we go. Right. It, it, it is, it is uh, changing slides, but it's just right. uh, for some right. reason right, not going on. on so I'll just, yeah. Um, yeah, so we have got a tool for, for staff on the ground and, and Metro Police and, and those kind of guys to, to fill in um, the, the damages that they see. Uh, the initial estimates were 1 billion rand worth uh, loss of stock and, and 15 billion rand worth of property damage. That was for, for Etekweni alone, not necessarily for the whole of uh, KZN. Uh, but then, you know, the other impacts that uh, the previous uh, speakers have, have mentioned, you know, workers, uh, effectively one week uh, has been lost, uh, wages, salaries uh, from uh, 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 thousands, hundreds of thousands of people have been, have been impacted. Uh, so 130,000, uh, most of them in the kind of retail and wholesale uh, sector, but as well as uh, logistics uh, companies as well. But importantly from the survey, uh, about 30% of businesses are saying that they are unsure whether they will reopen up again. So that's, I think, a, a critical area that uh, we're focusing on to kind of incentivize businesses to uh, reopen, make it easier, providing rates, rebates, and, and uh, support uh, for that. Uh, the first response, there's a short-term response that uh, the cities uh, put together. Uh, firstly, of course, the coordinated safety response and improved resourcing of uh, police on the ground. Um, so through the security cluster, there is ongoing uh, coordination with the different spheres of government around uh, policing and, and uh, safety on the ground. Um, we also trying to quickly procure uh, certain equipment and things that, uh, that uh, uh, police need to be able to manage riots. Uh, I think one of the things we found that the uh, police, both at Metro Police uh, as well as uh, SAPS, were not properly equipped to, to handle uh, uh, rioting of this uh, scale. And there's really a need for, for that to, to happen very quickly. There's the short-term uh, issues, and then there's the long-term issues uh, or the say medium-term issues around uh, training, retraining uh, police and, and uh, all of those issues. There are other initiatives that have been started around social cohesion, building social cohesion, also um, working towards uh, civic pride and, and starting to 
build on that spirit of volunteerism that we 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 saw towards the end of of last week um, and that should be uh, uh, taking effect in uh, about a week or so we should see some initiatives hitting the ground the other thing um, is that uh, i think one of the things we've noted is that it's uh, it's you can't wait for economic growth uh, to happen to to address the unemployment situation. There is a need for for some more immediate uh, interventions to be put uh, in place, um, and there we're talking about uh, public sector-led employment, uh, looking at things like your EPWP program and scaling up all of those uh, initiatives to be able to provide uh, uh, much, much uh, bigger uh, numbers in terms of uh, employment. Uh, we have had some discussions with National Treasury and some funding is going to be made available for uh, a kind of scaled up public sector led employment initiatives. We've also asked uh, National Treasury, uh, we've, we've highlighted and raised with them the issue of the basic income grant. Um, we think it, it needs to be put in place. Uh, uh, it, given that uh, unemployment has, has become um, uh, the kind of scale that it is at, uh, at the moment, it's not the long-term solution to uh, the issues, but it is, I think, uh, it will play a role in, in, in stabilizing uh, the, the, the country and, and addressing the desperation on the ground. Uh, repurposing of municipal grants. So there are a number of uh, municipal grants, grants that uh, the city is working with National Treasury to, to repurpose and to be able to uh, address that, to um, direct it towards uh, repairing damage uh, that was done. Uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, uh, I think, around uh, rescuing the image, both of the city as well as the country, um, to be able to uh, retain investment. Obviously, the, the platform for that is uh, a, a safe and stable environment. But uh, beyond that, we also there's, there's a lot of uh, damage repair uh, that needs to be done in terms of the image of the country and the, and, and the city as an investment location. Um, we've, we, we're putting in place some in incentives to uh, support properties that have been extensively uh, damaged. So there are some short-term uh, rates, rebates that properties uh, that, that business owners can qualify for. And then where there's uh, very, very significant damage, um, we can look up to uh, three years worth of, of support to, to, to rebuild. Uh, in terms of the, the, the next issue around uh, youth unemployment, so there's some uh, initiatives that are going to be started to, to scale up uh, skills development initiatives among the, uh, the youth using, uh, you know, the capacity, spare capacity in a lot of the tertiary ed education institutions. Um, uh, a, a lot of them are operating uh, mostly online now or, or in a hybrid uh, kind of environment. So we want to be able to use some of that capacity, uh, support them and uh, increase the number of uh, intake of students, learnerships, uh, etc. cetera. Um, we are also working with uh, the DTI and other sectors to put a business restart, restart uh, package on the table. Um, so we're looking mainly at, at your small businesses through CEDA uh, and having a, a one-stop center uh, uh, operational within the next uh, week or so at the Durban Exhibition Center. The idea is to have all of the different spheres of government, uh, whether it's CEDA or whether it's uh, a building plan approval that needs to to happen, so all of those kind of people will be in one place and and uh, hotline set up to to help businesses. Um, you know whether it's access uh, finance or um, uh, rebuild or apply for rates uh, incentives and and so forth. 
uh, and then there's you know issues around scaling up service delivery and building accountability uh, within um, the municipality and within government to to communities and and, and businesses. So there's a lot of uh, short term issues that uh, are being looked at, and like I've said, we've been um, in contact with uh, our colleagues from the different spheres of government. Uh, so there is a, a high level of coordination that uh, that's happening. Uh, there's a set of medium term issues that that we need to look at as well with rethinking and relooking at the township economic development model, the shopping center model, um, and, and you know, econ issues of economic transformation. So those are, those are medium term issues and the plans in place there. But for now, the, the, the focus for us is on all of those short term issues and working through uh, partnerships with, um, with the private sector, civil society, academia to um, to, to improve the, the, the environment for doing business. The, uh, the mayor has started um, engagements, there's engagements with the, all of this, the uh, CEOs uh, in the city uh, this afternoon. There's um, engagements planned over the next couple of days as well. So there's, I'm not going to talk about all of the pillars of the response plan. Um, I think I've just covered it in, in summary, but uh, each of them have uh, detailed actions as to you know, who's going to do what and, and how we're going to uh, get the economy back on, on track and um, ensure stability and a, and a conducive uh, working environment. Let me uh, leave it there uh, for now, and then we can um, handle questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Yeah, uh, thanks. And um, I think the key is obviously that there are there is a plan in place, but um, sort of the key is that that plan actually gets implemented um, to ensure that there is sort of some uh, real positive outcomes. Um, yeah, we're going to go through some of the questions shortly. I know we'll be running over, but before I do that, I'm going to ask Russell Curtis, who's also from the city, um, to just quickly give some input. He, he, he there were some questions in this morning session about sort of um, you know reassurance from industry you know to ensure that this type of thing doesn't happen again and you know what what is the city doing and, and russell gave some insights um i'm just going to try and and share with, uh, russell to is russell still on the call yeah i'm online uh, thanks so much Sean. Sorry. all right yes russell can you see uh, just maybe just repeat what you said this morning uh, in terms of some of the engagements that are taking place um you know on the ground Sure. Thanks very much, Sean, and uh, good afternoon, panelists, panel uh, uh, audience members. I'll be very brief in the interest of time. So I think it's clear right now that uh, private sector and faith-based organizations needed to, to really fill the vacuum that was left and step up to the plate. And from a safety and security point of view, a coordination point of view, and uh, now also a food relief and fuel supplies point of view, um, we are exceptionally grateful for our business leadership and our faith-based leadership that stepped in uh, when the systems were overwhelmed. One of the, uh, the um, groups that formed uh, I mean, this leadership structure myself was the Public-Private Partnership Security Structure. So this is uh, comprised of business leadership in the security industry, comprised of Metro Police, who did an absolute sterling job, but, but were totally overwhelmed and outnumbered. Uh, it's comprised of SAPS and um, a bit of uh, the, the, the government leadership. So that WhatsApp group and team formed very quickly, and uh, extra private security was being brought in from all over. And we lost a number of facilities, but we were able to, to save um, key ones, um, which we're very, very grateful for because uh, it was quite clear if we lost them, uh, it would have been uh, disinvestment and that would have had massive implications on the value chain of the automotive industry. But we managed to save um, key ones without mentioning names. And um, the upside is that public private partnership uh, security system brought uh, the chairs of government and private sector closer together on this issue and we remain in minute-by-minute uh, minute, uh, contacts via the group and, uh, and are rapidly redeploying. 
now that things have settled uh, a lot on the ground, you know, in three open, uh, our roads open, but still a lot of vigilance, still a lot of um, community policing forum uh, monitor required, and then uh, Metro Police Sats and Defence Force monitoring the major arterial roads. We've uh, got the wheels moving again, and the odd sporadic um, burst of, I'm going to call it what it is, the odd sporadic burst of lunacy, uh, which uh, tries its luck here and there, is being effectively addressed now that the, uh, the, the partnership is in place, and now that uh, everyone has got uh, significant focus and a lot more resources. So things are uh, under control, I'd like to say. I'm speaking in the affirmative uh, prophetic, and uh, we really just want to empathize with all of business and empathize with all of communities, because uh, everyone, uh, in one way, shape, or form, was sadly damaged. And everyone is impacted, but yet we, we came together very quickly. And, uh, we fended off the worst of the treasonous cabal's attempt, and we'll continue to do so because now that um, public sector, now that uh, private sector leadership and faith-based leadership had to step forward, um, they're going to stay in a very tight partnership with government leadership now. Uh, I think that's for the better in terms of cooperative governance. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Russell. Um, yeah, I'm going to go ahead to the polls because I want to get input from the polls, and then if there is time, we can always go back to some of the questions. So I'm going to launch a couple of polls, and basically uh, for, for the firm that it is applicable to, we'd like you to give a response in relation to the various areas, and it's going to be start with operations. So you know, is your factory currently not fully operational, and what are the reasons for that? Um, it would be appreciated if you could just provide your insights in terms of, of, of that. You know, is it, you know, if there has been no impact, please state that. Otherwise, and you can select multiple options, you know, damage to buildings, supply chain disruption, absenteeism of employees, fear of continued unrest, theft of stock, uh, damage to or theft of machinery and equipment, or customers have withdrawn orders. So again, you can give multiple responses, but we appreciate it if you could indicate uh, if your operation is not fully operational, um, what are the reasons for that? And like I said, um, and there's a couple of these because these also give insight in terms of the sector reports that we're going to put together in terms of, you know, the impact um, that has been on industry. I'll talk about a minute for that. Like I said, we've got about five of these polls to get through, so I'm going to go through them quite quickly, but uh, we'll share the results as well um, while we, yeah, uh, maybe on the next poll I'll, I'll mention that. These results will be compiled and also made available to industry uh, and obviously to key stakeholders. Um, like I said, there's a lot happening in the space at the moment, but um, in terms of trying to understand the impact. Right, I'm just gonna give it maybe another 10 more seconds and then I'll stop the poll. I'm gonna stop the poll now. I'll share those results quickly. But like I said, this will be um, thing so um, you, a lot of the firms in the market did the thing it had no impact on the operation uh, in terms of where there was impact uh, it's uh, fear of continued unrest uh, customers have withdrawn orders um, and um, supply chain disruptions um, yeah sorry okay uh, it's, it's supply chain disruption absenteeism and fear of continued unrest. those are the biggest uh, issues that have uh, been impacting firms in terms of, of them operating effectively we move on to the next poll, which uh, touches on the, 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 the important elements um, of, of people. Um, and I know a lot of people I've engaged, a lot of firms have highlighted they have some major concerns in terms of this particular area, both currently and obviously going forward. Again, if I could request that you provide your insights in terms of, has there been no impact? A direct, uh, and again, you can choose multiple uh, choices. Uh, suffer direct physical harm, unharmed, but unable to travel to work, unharmed, but not willing to travel to work, or experience psychological uh, trauma. We've got about 35%, 40% of the people have responded. Gonna give another maybe ten more seconds and then stop. And 
going to stop the poll. And I'll share those results. Um, so psychological trauma, um, over half of the firms that were impacted said that's the biggest impact and then unharmed but unable to travel to work. Uh, those are the big issue, but a significant portion of firms indicated that uh, psychological trauma um, was sort of, uh, you know, where the people had been affected uh, the, the most. Uh, in relation to the, the next one, which is the supply chain, and I think obviously where the supply chain has been impacted, a very short poll, um, again, you know, no impact damage to a key supplier or customer. So again, you can have multiple options. Um, logistics, for example, materials unable to leave the port or lo uh, logistical node, and then unavailability of raw material. Um, so again, just trying to understand to what extent the logistics or the supply chain has been impacted as a result of the, the social unrest. I think about 40% of responses came quite quickly. No. Maybe got five more seconds. I'm going to stop the poll. Right, let's stop it. So here it's, um, as you will see, uh, the logistics uh, materials unable to leave port or uh, a particular node that was over half of them. Uh, a third, just under a third, which is high, damaged a key supply. And obviously that is a concern and the unavailable raw materials. So, um, you know, the firms were generally affecting all the key areas that were noted, um, but obviously logistics being the, the biggest issue. Um, then just check the. So, and then second to last one, apologies, I know there's a lot, but it's just, I think, um, in terms of market demand, um, how do you expect the unrest impact your market demand? Um, obviously from no change, and then is it gonna be a decline of one to 10, 11 to 20, greater than 20% or an increase? Because maybe some firms have been able to take advantage of the, of, of, of the situation that has occurred. Give me another five more seconds, a few more coming in. I'm gonna stop the poll, share the results. Um, so half of the firms said that um, there'll be a decline of, you know, anything from one to 10%. Um, 12%, which is also notable, said it'll be uh, between 11 and 20, uh, one and 3%, so it'll be over 20%. Um, so that's important to note. Um, and then just the, the final poll, which is on the recovery. And here, there's actually three questions that are, you, you're gonna be asked um, in terms of the recovery process. I'm gonna launch it in the interim. Uh, so the first one is, uh, is your business able to recover? Um, you know, so you know, there was no impact, yes, minimal impact, medium, um, you know, not fully, but significant impact or no, no recovery is possible. So the first question is about, is your business uh, able to recover? The second question is, what is your investment confidence in South Africa? Um, you know, and then the last one is, what is your business confidence in KZN? Um, so it's trying to understand, you know, the differentiates between looking at South Africa versus KZN and trying to, to unpack that. So there's a little bit, three more, there's three questions here. Uh, so this should take a little bit longer. Uh, to complete, but it's just again to try to understand uh, the sentiment and the recovery uh, process, um, both at a national level and obviously at a provincial level going forward. Right, about a third of the respondents have completed it, so coming in. Just while we're doing that, so yeah, the, our report that we're going to generate, um, we are going to submit to the presidency. There's going to be some, um, obviously, specific detail in that report, but we will also be making a report available, uh, an aggregated report uh, to industry and uh, as well as other key stakeholders as well. Um, like I said, the, I'm pretty sure there's going to be a number of reports, um, you know, floating around and a lot of reports will be generated going forward. Um, but it's really our intention to get sort of a, an insight in terms of what has been the impact um, and obviously submit that to the presidency, which will hopefully assist in terms of some of the actions 
actions uh, that need to be taken going forward. And I think uh, Jeff's uh, presentation also touched on some of those a little bit earlier. I'm just going to maybe another 10 seconds and then I'll stop this one. Right, I'm going to stop it and I'll share these results quickly. So in terms of is your business able to recover, a majority said yes, minimal impact. And obviously that's encouraging. Um, you know, none of the respondents in this particular session said that um, not fully or, or will be unable to, to recover, which is encouraging. In terms of confidence in South Africa, um, you know, 30% said no change. Um, a third said my business will only consider investment in South Africa um, in the case of fundamental change in the business environment. I think that's obviously very telling. And the biggest one is my business will continue to invest cautiously in South Africa. 36% um, highlighted that. In terms of KZN, uh, quite similar uh, in terms of, of um, actually not quite, yeah, very, very, very similar response. 6% um, um, said that they will not invest in the foreseeable future in KZN. And obviously that is, is, is notable. All right. All right. Um, like I said, it's, it's now five past three, but before we sort of look at closing the session, I, and, you know, considering what has been covered by the speakers, which I think has been, you know, really insightful and, and, and um, you know, informative, um, I'd also like to just give um, other, you know, participants an opportunity uh, to, to have a say. Uh, if you would like to uh, simply, um, um, raise your hand. I think there is a you should be able to raise your hand in, in the thing and then we can allow you to have your say or even ask a general question. So if any of the participants uh, would like to make a comment uh, in relation to uh, you know what has happened or ask a general question, um, you know, please feel free to do this. Um, I think you should be able to yeah. Just while we're waiting on that, um, in terms of some of the questions that were asked, I'm going to try and go through them. And, and um, obviously, if one of the panelists would like to contribute, um, we spoke about the reports. Um, we'll we'll make a, uh, submit a consolidated report available. NAMS is working on a report. NARCAM has a report. So there's a lot in place at the moment. Um, I know that um, a question was asked about the communication from Kyoto to local government. I think we all saw that. It was in the press this week. Um, has there been any similar communication from any of the other OEMs? I haven't seen anything. I can say that I personally haven't seen anything. I'm not saying there hasn't been, but I, I'm not privy to anything. And I haven't, um, you know, not say that I necessarily would be, but um, I haven't uh, seen. Uh, Mark is no longer on the call. So I think, um, we do have a hand up. Ah, Neeson. Hi, Neeson. Hello. Hi. hi. Just a, yeah, a question I'd like to ask. Are we going to get any sort of rates rebate? Um, good question. That was asked earlier. Um, Ajit, do you want to maybe answer it? Because you're going to apply for it a, a, a rebate or something. Is that right, Ajit? Uh, yes. Yes. The, uh, you can apply for, for the rebate. Um, we, we just need to get the hotline set up so um, anyone can phone in and... and uh, uh, apply for for the rebate depending on on how bad the damage is okay Megan, you like if i can just chip in there quickly we actually have that rebate application form already that i have asked josh to place on the cluster sharepoint sites so members will be able to access that application form probably from tomorrow uh, josh, josh does have it thank you very much for that megan thanks um, I'm just going through the things, uh, some of the points that made here. Um, yeah, the point about the risk profile of business in KZN has fundamentally changed. Uh, you know, I think that is generally correct, correct. But I think what also came through in the present or the, the session today is this is a reflection of South Africa as a whole. So, um, you know, I think in, in South Africa as a whole will, will, will be impacted. And obviously, we need to all look at addressing that uh, concern. Um, yeah, there's a point made in relation to the automotive supply park, and I, I think you know, you know, that is very important in terms of re-establishing confidence in the region. And I think the powers that be need to urgently ensure that that particular initiative uh, gets up and running um, and, and is not further delayed um, as it has been uh, for a long period of time. I think that is sort of one. Well, that is something which which they can definitely get behind uh, and ensure it takes place. Um, and, and is not further delayed. And I think a really good point made in relation to the automotive supply park. Um, yeah, obviously safety concerns in national highways, and I think Russell touched on 
um, you know, what has been put in place and obviously the, the, the importance of the entry corridor was highlighted and, um, you know, that there's a safety and security needs to be maintained to ensure that, you know, movement of goods and, and people um, can take place without any sort of um, safety concerns. Um, yeah, it, it, again, it, a point made in relation to what the KZN government is doing to prepare for, uh, you know, this type of thing happening again. Um, Russell Curtis again highlighted some of the initiatives in place, and, but I think the point made is that it needs to look also uh, not only at the urban areas, but also at the, the rural areas, um, because I know there was a lot of um, issues that occurred in, in, the, in the rural areas, and those also need to be uh, adequately uh, addressed. And I, you know, hopefully this also, what has occurred, operates as a bit of a wake-up call, um, both at a sort of a, a provincial and also national government, in terms of making sure that, you know, the security personnel are adequately uh, geared to, to deal with these issues. I think we all read the articles in terms of not having sufficient, um, you know, riot gear, um, you know, equipment, um, water cannons, things like that, um, which, which is definitely uh, not ideal. Um, yeah. Uh, and then um, I'm just trying to see, I think there was one or two questions. I didn't get a chance to, to have a look at them. Um, I think we will try and uh, follow up with some of the questions. Again, is there anyone else that would like to, to contribute, maybe share something anecdotal before we look at closing today's session? I'm not going to pick on anyone because that's not the intention of today. Um, I think um, I'd rather have firms, you know, you know, if they would like to have a, a say or ask a question to do so, but I'm not going to pick on any firm to think. I have, we have received a lot of input from companies. I'm going to, again, uh, request that you please look to complete the survey. Um, Megan, if I can ask you maybe just to post that again in the chat. Um, if you could look at completing that survey, um, that would be greatly appreciated to assist us in terms of the compilation of the report. Uh, going forward. Um, in closing, I obviously like to thank everybody for attending today's session. I think it's 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 been you know uh, 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 well a difficult session to to run, but I think a much needed session and to talk about these issues. Um, I remain optimistic and hopeful. I know it can be difficult in, in these particular times, but um, I do believe you know we are a great country and we can achieve things. Um, you know, wonderful things, and and you know it's important that that we do work together and. Uh, you know, obviously focus on why it happened and there are people and powers that be that are looking at you know, you know the reasons for this uh, but at the same time focusing on how do we sort of um, you know deal with the issues going uh, forward and w w focus on the right things and I think you know all the speakers uh, including the industry representatives have highlighted the importance of um, you know investors being confident uh, in terms of investing in the region um, and and um, you know that that you know there, there are some bigger things that we need to to focus on all right I've launched a final poll so it'd be appreciated if you just uh, do the the final assessment. Um, otherwise, um, obviously, I'd like to thank everybody for attending today's session. Um, I trust you, you all, you know, stay safe, uh, stay well, um, take care, and obviously look forward to engaging with you uh, going forward in relation to our future um, working group sessions. And just once again, I'd like to thank our speakers, um, you know, um, um, Michael Mabasa from uh, NAMSA, Renee Mathalal, uh, from uh, Narcam and Ajiv Maharaj from the, the Etiopian Municipality uh, for their insightful uh, and, and, and contributions and, and, um, to today's session. Uh, thank you very much.